move up. I know this is like uh, having taught in colleges, like no one likes to sit in the front row, but uh, you guys are all welcome to move up. Uh, first of all, I'm super thankful for uh, the fine folks at Fenwick for hosting us in this awesome space. Um, do you want to say a little bit that you learned about the practice? Yeah, thanks so much, Trevor. So uh, first, we're really thrilled to, to partner with Open Grid Ventures and, and welcome everybody here to learn a little bit about how to raise the seed round. My name is Jonathan Saget. I'm a partner here in the startup and venture group. I've been at Fenwick for about five years and practicing for about 15 years. Uh, just very briefly about Fenwick, we're one of the uh, we incorporated Apple, and we specialize in representing tech-enabled. So all we do is tech and life science. Um, the only time you'll see us with an insurance company, uh, you know, like a big insurance company or like an energy company is when we're helping them invest in the startups. Um, and every aspect of our firm is built to serve these tech-enabled high growth businesses. So we're a full-service law firm. That means we, we can help you with your corporate needs, your intellectual property needs, um, God forbid you have a litigation, we can help with that. The way to think about it is more about what we don't do, which is really two things. We can't help you with wills, so like no trust in estates. We can't help you with office leases. But really everything else we do for our clients, starting from very early stages, we incorporate companies, help them raise their, you know, their first rounds, help them with their initial hiring, and we grow with them. Um, we actually represent more unicorns per lawyer um, than any other firm in the country. I think we're over 80 that we represent, and we're about 400 lawyers. We're only in the US. Our headquarters is in Mountain View, but um, you're now all in, in our New York office, which is our, our second largest office. We also have an office in San Francisco, Seattle, Santa Monica, and our newest office, which is filled with regulatory experts, is in Washington, DC. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. I think it's gonna be a really good conversation. Can I ask you two yeah. interview questions? Yeah, I'm please, gonna... please, I'm uh, all for it. So uh, if I'm an early stage founder, um, a, my uh, uncle's kind of a lawyer and has told me that he can, you know, get me up and going on the cheap. And then, uh, so I'm thinking about that. And then I've got offers at, you know, a ton of different firms, all of whom clicking through the websites look like perfectly respectable firms. And, you know, I'm looking at all the, the faces and you know, they're all cleaned up for their corporate photo. How do I, so A, like, why should I perhaps not go with my uncle? And then B, is what do you tell founders? I mean, everybody's got their own special sauce, but like, what should a founder be asking to tell a particular firm that's right for them? Versus uh, any other firm. So, so I love these questions. Okay, so first, like, should you hire your uncle? The answer is maybe. Your uncle could be a really great lawyer. So I'm not gonna prejudge your uncle, but I think what you're really getting at is, you know, um, is it a mistake to try to do this the cheapest way possible early on? And the answer to that is often yes, for a few reasons. Number one, the big startup shops like Fenwick, um, we're very good at making sure that we're not bankrupting our early stage companies. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to grow with them and represent them when they get to late stages, right? So that means that any good startup firm who does this all the time is going to do things in a way and can be creative with their fee structure to ensure that you're not like blowing through all of your runway just to incorporate. Like that makes no sense whatsoever, right? Um, and, and we're also able to be like super efficient and we have really talented lawyers at all different levels that, that we can involve to make sure you're getting like exactly what you need, which I think is also a big point is that your lawyers, lawyers who do startup work all the time, understand what you need and when you need it, right? They're not churning a file. They're not just sort of like wasting time. Like that's a very big thing. You try and understand like, hey, here's exactly what we need to do. And we're gonna do it in the most efficient way possible because candidly for really early stage companies, your needs are pretty limited, okay? From, from the legal side and what your investors are gonna care about are pretty limited. And a lot of what we do is we teach our founders, not just how to consume legal services, but like we teach them, you know, in a way kind of like how to run a lot of this stuff themselves. Um, but every founder is different, right? Some founders want us to be more involved than others. And we, we, we adjust to that. So like, you know, it, is it a good idea to use the, the cheapest firm possible? Um, I, Look, I, I, we're a premium service provider, right? You know, and I get that and, and we are expensive, you know, compared to like, you know, somebody who went to like Hollywood Upstairs Law School um, and is pretending they know what they're doing, right? But 
there's a lot more value that that we can provide with that. So um, I think it's important to find a really good um, startup lawyer, no matter what. Now, how do you distinguish between everybody? You got to talk to people at these firms, and I think any good firm is going to be very transparent with you about how their fees work, right? Their fee structure. They're going to be really transparent with you about how you're going to be interacting with them, like who you're going to be working with. Are you going to be working with somebody who's like right out of law school and doesn't really know what they're doing? Are you going to be working with people who actually have been practicing for some time and are and are more capable? Um, and so you should understand like what you're signing up for. And the other thing I would suggest that you all think about is um, one of the things I love about working with founders is this, um, you know, this sort of like persistent and indefatigable like optimism that like we're going to make it and grow into this incredible company. Do you want to start at a place that you're eventually going to outgrow, right? Maybe you do because you really like the, the people that you meet there and you're like, no, these people are great and I like the fee structure and I want to work with them. Great. As long as you're working with a seasoned startup lawyer who knows this stuff inside and out, that's that's my first concern for any founder that I that I speak with. But as you start to think long term and all the best startup lawyers help you think like multiple all things being equal, it's better to stay at one place the whole time because there's always a cost in switching firms, right? It's it's either bandwidth drain or sometimes there are like fees associated with it. Um, and so if you could just missed the knowledge of yeah, exactly. You miss you lose the institutional knowledge. So like all things being equal, like you're better off staying at one place the whole time. That doesn't mean all companies do, right? And we you know take you know we work with lots of companies that were at other firms before they they came to us. And there are ways to deal with that. So I think at the end of the day, you're looking for expertise. You're looking for transparency. And then the last thing, which is really important, is you should like your lawyer, right? If you don't like your lawyer, you're not going to call them, right? You're not going to. Did we got to stand? No. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Now we're professional. <laughs> Yes, great. Awesome. No, we're iterating. We're iterating. <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. Great. Okay. Um, so, you know, like, you got to make sure you like them. Like, do you want to talk to them? Because ultimately, if you don't like them, you're probably not going to trust them. And if you don't trust your lawyer, then what are we doing? Right? Like, that's the whole point. Cool. All right. That makes sense. Thanks. Guys, get to the panel. Okay, this cool. is the way more interesting stuff anyway. All right. Uh, cool. Um, one thing I want to just acknowledge, point out, is that um, obviously not everybody goes into the fundraising process with the same perspective and experience. And so to that end, uh, we do try and uh, make sure our panels are coming from this process with uh, as much diversity across the panel as possible. Um, this is actually, I think, the first panel that we done in a few years where we didn't necessarily get that same diversity. Um, and there's been a question asked around, you know, in this fundraising environment, is it affecting different groups of people differently? And so the sort of timing and I think optics of like, hey, like, the, you know, a uh, couple folks who happen to be free for, for this panel are, you know, a couple of dudes who kind of, you know, uh, uh, better looking, but kind of look like me. Um, and I, I will just say that uh, we did have a few people for whom the timing just did not work out. So it wasn't like we had uh, difficulty finding a uh, diverse group of founders who had just raised and uh, um, wanted to participate, but just I think like leading into the July 4th weekend and the timing of it did not work out. So this was um, purely coincidence. All is not lost for, um, uh, for different groups of founders. So, yeah, no, thanks for calling that out. And I mean, I, I think one, you know, we emerged from our experience feeling like we definitely came from a position of privilege. And one of the questions we had was how different would this be if we didn't have the same privileges that we had? So yeah, I appreciate you, you calling it out. Cool. Definitely, definitely. Right. So um, uh, let's let's do this in sort of chronological order here. Um, and, and we'll start out from the perspective of like, there's an idea. And at some point, the initial investment in the company is your time and the opportunity cost, right? So can you help folks uh, understand the process of like, when was the initial idea 
before you took dollars around it? And, and how did you decide that like, this was either like, A, worth quitting my job or, or asking some, asking anybody for money and the opportunity cost and, and you know, was this the sort of original idea? So why don't, I don't know if I know this origin story. Maybe. Well, I guess, it, in, I guess following the first question you asked me when we first met, which is tell me about your pivot, uh, the original, original idea started, I guess, maybe two and a half years ago, slight, maybe three years ago, slightly before the pandemic. Um, and I had found myself uh, amidst conversations with folks that I grew up with. Um, I grew up kind of east of New York City, Queens, Nassau County area, um, and a number of my friends um, who ran small businesses. I run a lending infrastructure business. Uh, today, um, they had conveyed to me that they could not secure structured capital. Many of them were minority or immigrant business owners, and they were asking friends and family for money. Um, and I was somewhat bewildered in this behavior, and I was being asked to help them set up the deals. I had no background in this whatsoever, um, but I was just a trusted confidant uh, of, of these folks. Um, and I found myself in the middle between friends and family funding sources, and also small business owners who had fantastic cash flow businesses. And I was thinking to myself, there's a massive disconnect in the lending economy. Um, there is you know, a dearth of fantastic small businesses that for one reason or another, whether it's lack of credit or collateral, cannot secure financing. And this is a, a, an economic security issue, given that when half the small businesses in America ask those in their personal network for financing, um, those deals need to be sound and responsible, and that was the impetus for starting what is now uh, you know, a lending SaaS business. Um, and so the original concept started about three years ago, but it took about seven months of just really concepting, talking to people. Like seven months full time, or like nights and weekends. It was. It started out like I would say first three months, nights and, nights and weekends, and then I quit my job when I realized it was the middle of the pandemic. This is well before the vaccine. I didn't know if the world would ever be coming back. And as somebody in their mid-30s, I'm like, I'm just gonna take my entire life savings, burn it, this is a write-off. If there was ever a time to do this, let's, let's do this. Um, and then it, it took about six months after I uh, really was working on it to feel confident enough to, or to even have a concept enough to need a dollar. Um, and that's when I, I mean, that's yeah. funny to hear you say, like, if there was ever time to do this, you know, like, oh, why don't I spend all my savings now? Because, you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. So, you know, some other people might come out that approach and say, oh, now's not the time to do anything risky. But you're like, hey, we don't even know if we're going to survive. And so I, I would say, if you, screw it, if, you're if, if you know me, you would say that I'm extremely risk averse. Um, but I also think for me and some folks that are of similar age or, or background, I think the pandemic personally gave me an awareness of mortality. Right. That I did not have before, where I was in and around folks who were very sick or passed away, and you just don't look at things fundamentally in the same way. And so gotcha. that was what you know shifted my point of view. Gotcha. I appreciate that. What about you? Uh, so in some ways, I'll give maybe the opposite story to yours, which I think makes for a good, good unplanned, but makes for a good panel. Um, so um, I uh, spent the last ten years at my previous company and was starting to think about you know, what I would do next. And in sort of going through that journey, I was both looking at, I was interested in something that was very different. Um, and so thought about joining big tech, thought about joining early stage companies. And through that process, reconnected with an old friend of mine who you know, we worked together years ago, he'd gone on to do a bunch of new things. Um, and he was going through kind of the same journey of thinking of doing, uh, of, you know, of, of what would be next. And, I think we both had this moment of like, you know, it is such a rare and delightful thing to have somebody who you know you love to work with um, and, you know, would, would have been on my short list of folks to start a company with. You know, what are the odds that those two people are, are looking for a job at the same time? Um, so we came first to the idea of working together um, and kind of reached an agreement that we would commit to doing something. And then the question was, what are we going to work on? And so over the course of a few months, we, you know, had, had, you know, uh, had a, a, you know, a series of phone calls where we kind of brainstormed, like, what are the things that have a good, you know, why now? What are the things that have a good fit for us? What are the things that we think are interesting and make for, for good markets? Um, and then um, 
basically when we, we set a date when we would both start full time and when we started full time, we, we were very careful to not really sort of dive into working on an idea until we started full time, but we started full time. And then, you know, basically within a week, we kind of, you know, said like, by the end of this week, we need to make a call on what we're focusing on. We made that call in a week and then dove in from there. Just out of curiosity, um, there are folks that come at this, you know, especially uh, I think sometimes timing wise coming out of like B school or whatever, where people like decide to be entrepreneurs first and then go in versus other folks whose whole life story is leading up to doing this one particular thing. Do you have any advice for people who come at it from the, I want to be an entrepreneur first about like pitfalls in that process if you're not finding something organically that you would say uh, in terms of your decision process? Yeah, I mean, so our approach was to time box it. So we said to ourselves, when we went full time, we actually gave ourselves a very excited, accelerated timeline. You know, we felt, both felt like if this isn't working, it's in our interest to fail very quickly. So we basically said, if we can't commit to, to an idea, prototype it out, raise money in three months, we're gonna go get jobs. Um, that's so very short. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, were, we were aggressive. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, it was this forcing function where we thought like, okay, every passing week, if we, um, you know, don't kind of move forward in developing conviction, we're just going to call it. And um, how many ideas actually made the serious consideration set? I would say maybe 10. Okay. Um, and we, you know, we, we, what we found over the, uh, you know, that period of time, and to be clear, like, not all of this happened in that week, right? Yeah. You know, a, a lot of these ideas were, were kind of struck beforehand. But what we found was that for most ideas, the more research we did, the less conviction we had in those things. And for the one that we settled on, um, the more research we did, the more conviction we had, both in terms of the market, we had product ideas, we had expertise. And so that's the one that we ended up fo focusing on. Um, but I, you know, for me, I think that notion of like time boxing it, and really, like you need to find something that you. We, we were we were very very fascinated with this question of like what will it feel like to find the idea? And once we found it, it was very clear. But until that moment, we were it felt so nebulous and abstract. Like what will it mean to to, to hit on something that feels right? Gotcha. Okay, so you both hit on an idea, at least a problem set that you wanted to tackle. Now, at some point, you say, well, okay. Um, if I'm going to do this, uh, you know, not being attached to some trust fund, like I'm probably going to need to raise some capital, um, and you need to come up with an amount and or at least a goal around it. So, how did you decide, like, what you were looking for, and did you wind up picking that number up? Did it morph after you started talking to folks? Yeah. So I, I think it's a little bit form and function. So I, um, in order to build a minimum viable or a minimum lovable product in my sector, which is fintech, um, it, it, co it costs money, right? right? It costs a level of capital um, if you're going to you know, bring pieces together and build lending infrastructure or fundraising infrastructure. Um, minimum viable products across sectors are cost different things, right? And so for me, it costs a little bit more money. If you're going to put money, if, you're, if my customer was going to put money on a platform, it needed to be trustworthy. It needed to be secure. It can't be like a weekend. It cannot. Yeah, it couldn't be me in the background moving stuff around. It really needed to be. I needed to be able to enter into that very first conversation and say you can, you can use this and feel good about it. And so, you know, in doing, you know, in doing the math of what would it take to get that first product up and running, that math really yielded an amount of like one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. And you know, we. We're, and I was very lucky to have met a co-founder along the way after I had started uh, working on Ned. And I think for me, that number was, you know, uh, I guess, workshop with a, a number of different kind of like engineering friends and costs and diligencing solution providers and things like that, because we built on different types of API models. And so that was the number that we came to. And then it was actually after that, uh, that we realized that we did it much cheaper. And so we actually found ourselves with like a little bit more money um, and in a position of a little bit more leverage of having a working product, which is when really uh, Forum Ventures found us at a pitch competition. And that was the first um, accelerator sizable check that we, you know, uh, that we took on, which, which really set us up with 
$200,000 at that point, um, and you know, a little bit of wind at our backs with a working functioning system. It, it's sort of interesting how sectors wind up developing in terms of their maturity because you know, you say, well, you, you know, you can't do something in the financial infrastructure side and a weekend hack project. But I remember getting one of the earliest Venmo requests from Andrew Cortina, and I'm 100% sure that it was probably out of his personal <laughs> bank account at the time, that there was sort of money moving. But that was at a time where, like, there really were no fintech startups at all, and nobody had any, you know, sort of nobody knew the right questions or all that sort of stuff. And I think what happens is, like, if you're the first one doing something, no one knows what to ask, so you can kind of get away with it. Then everybody realizes what's going on and all the questions get asked and it becomes really expensive to do. And then if you're sort of after that, there's other things you can plug into, APIs and Stripe and Plaid and all of this sort of stuff that make it easier. And the one thing to add in our case was, you know, we had to go against skepticism. So fundamentally, our user is a business owner that might feel disenfranchised or who might have been turned down by uh, structured capital providers. And so in order to even have a conversation with somebody who might have been fleeced in the past, uh, you need to be able right. to show them something in a way that it, it's it's a little even bulletproof in a sense um, before you even engage in that conversation. And we felt really strongly about that from day one. And you have to know your sector yeah. too, right? That's gonna be true for your sector, for healthcare, for you know any number of things along those verticals. Whereas, you know, I don't know, maybe something like dating site, you'd just be like, oh, you yeah. know, I'll upload my photo, we'll see how it goes. Um, what, how did you come up with your initial number, especially considering the fact that you give yourself this rather short window, so I can't imagine the number was at least very big to start. Um, so, so our approach was, I mean, we, we kind of did a bottoms up in terms of thinking about what hires we need to make, how long we felt like we needed, um, you know, in terms of runway to get, you know, to get ourselves to a place where we'd be in a position to raise a larger seed round. Um, we're, we're not in fintech, we're in the data privacy space, but again, a space where it's like not messing around. You need to think about compliance. You need to think about building a product that really works. Nobody's going to trust you to manage their, their data if, you're, you know, if your product isn't, isn't well built. Um, and, uh, and so we knew that we would need a healthy amount of, of, of runway to get there. So, so that was essentially the math. So we said, you know, in addition to co-founders, you know, who else do we think we'll need to hire? We focused, you know, raising a pre-seed entirely on technical hires um, and felt like getting a kind of real robust, you know, V1 product out to market would be the milestone for us, you know, trying to graduate to seed. So we said, you know, if we want to make two technical hires, one front end focus, one back end focus, and we want to have, you know, 18 months, which is basically, you know, six months to build a product, six months to, you know, kind of get it out to market and to think about fundraising and six months of buffer in case something goes wrong. Like then the math just says like what you know what is it what is that what are those numbers net out to and that, that was kind of how we how we did the math and, and you effectively raised that pre seed round pre product pre product right? okay. yeah I mean we we and this you know to to what we were saying at the beginning I think definitely comes from from a position of privilege for us um but it's an area where we have a lot of expertise I, I was was the CTO at my previous job responsible for data protection. Um, and so it had a lot of knowledge and, and credibility in the space. My co-founder similarly had a, no, a lot of knowledge. And I think also the fact that we had worked together sort of uh, de-risked the team in some ways. Um, so we we found, we were not sure what it would look like to go out and, and raise and found that um, some of those questions um, were um, somewhat assuaged by, you know, between us having a background together and a background in the industry. When you, went out in that situation to try and raise. The actual pitch and the conversation and the narrative uh, of all of the things that you could sort of share, right? There's some people who would say, well, you know, I know they're gonna be looking for traction, so I'm gonna take whatever little thing I've done and try and make it seem like it's something versus other people who go in and say, no, we just, we're just free product. Like we're just, this is what we are. Yeah. And we're not gonna even talk about that. We're not gonna sort of, you know, try and excuse it for it or whatever. Um, we're gonna talk about us as a team, you know, and, and we're just the right folks to back, or we're gonna talk about the problem. 
mm -hmm. and we're going to convince people is a problem worth going after, and our solution is is the right one. And then you know, and then if they like that, then we'll go into why we're the team. What did you actually focus on in that pre-product pitch, and what do you think the initial folks who, who came in what resonated? Yeah, really good question, and I could probably talk for for an hour, an hour about that. Into the shift, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, so, so I think uh, yeah, a, a, a few takes on it. So um, we um, you know, to our credit or as a fall, um, try to be you know, sort of uh, you know, honest and transparent about where we're at um, to the extreme in our pitches. So we definitely did not sort of you know show somebody the product and try to you know massage that into like oh somebody's you know we have this user or you know put logos of just people who had given us feedback on in the deck. these people something. are really interested yeah yeah exactly i mean so we, we you know we quoted folks but we were very clear like this is a person we interviewed um what we done you know i think what we spoke to was that first of all this is a big idea this is a growing space um there's a lot of white space in the market Second of all, the team, you know, it's a strong, well-qualified team that works well together. And third, that we had done a, a lot of homework on the idea. You know, at the time that we raised, um, we probably had done, you know, 30 customer interviews um, and saying like, you know, we have very specific feedback from buyers in the market, um, I, I think was, was also helpful. Um, I think one thing that we learned was that, um, you know, I, I think every pre-seed or seed focused uh, firm has some line on their website that says like, no company is too early. <laughs> um, and what we learned was that for some folks that is true and for some folks that is not true. So we got into some calls where people expected us to be able to answer very sophisticated questions about, you know, how, what is the, you know, what is your pricing model or how does the product solve this problem? And when we said like, we, we don't know, we haven't built it yet. Um, you know, for some folks that was a disqualifier and some folks really leaned into it. But I think um, definitely, um, I, I think we wanted to be transparent around it and wanted to make sure that if folks were coming on, they sort of understood and were, were in for the ride uh, based on, on the stage of your ride. Do you think those calls with funds that maybe you might have said to them, hey, you guys look a little later stage, like I don't know if this is the right fit. And they're like, no, 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 we're opportunistic. Like, and you were kind of skeptical about going into that call. Do you think those calls were actually useful, or would you rather not have wasted your time? <laughs> Good question. Depends I mean, on the firm. This firm was a waste of time. No, no I mean, I think every call was super useful. If I could um, redo everything and schedule things, like you know, with with some master plan in my hands, I would have put those calls later in the series of calls that we did because I think. They were they asked the hardest questions or, or you know some of the hardest questions that we got and I think we every single investor call we did we learned and I would have loved to have the best possible answers for for those calls um, but I think we we learned a ton and you know especially for multi stage funds who were willing to take a pre seed call who were a lot of those folks who said like we can do pre seed but actually this is too early in the current economic climate I think for those folks. It is really. It was really interesting for us to learn. Like, okay, what does a multi-stage fund expect us to be able to answer? And I, I hope that that it made our pitch tighter for the pre-seed, but I think it will make our pitch a lot tighter for a, a future, you know, seed or Series A. Okay. All right. So you went to a pitch competition, uh, pitch forum, you know, um, and uh, sometimes that can be very useful. You found your initial accelerator from it. Did you go to others? Was it useful in any way? Like, would you recommend that people did that? You know, I don't have a hard or fast recommendation on accelerators or not. I think at the time we we found Forum to be a very good fit for us from a thesis standpoint. They focused on fintech and SaaS only, and that was squarely, you know, what what we were building. Um, and at the time, uh, we were also not what we were today. And so, you know, back to this pivot Forum. You know, we started basically as a consumer platform, a, a fundraising platform for small businesses. The moment, and this is while we were in the accelerator, but you know, at the end of 2021 um, and into early 2022, when we were in the accelerator, when we were you know, transacting our first transactions on the platform, lenders 
uh, small business lenders, large organizations saw what we had done and they had asked us, can we provide NED as an operating system? And, and so that was kind of that lightning in a bottle realization where we actually had inadvertently built revenue-based lending in a rail system, which didn't exist uh, you know, already. And so Forum actually really helped us pivot like aggressively. I'm talking pendulum swinging left to right in a matter of weeks, um, you know, really rethinking our product roadmap, rethinking how we were gonna structure conversations with future customers. How are we gonna take a learning of the last year and really apply it forward in a SaaS model? And so for us, I, I found them indispensable because we are where we are today with that support. I probably would not have been able to have navigated that moment um, without frankly professional help. I had never fundraised before. I was a first time founder. Um, I had only operated mid-sized businesses, never like a you know, early stage startup. So Forum was important. And then they, you know, with an accelerator, they have demo days and investor weeks and their demo days were in the middle of May of last year. And so in hearing world's greatest time, the world's greatest <laughs> timing. And so we had a spectacular failure um, the first time we, we went out and attempted to raise for all of the right reasons that we should have failed. We had just recently pivoted. We were put out without a really understanding of who we were as a company yet. We had some great like potential customers. We had a great technology, but there was nothing concrete there. And I think, thankfully, we went through the motions and did not get anything. I mean, it, it turned out well because it allowed for us to have early conversations with like 80 investors who passed, but many of whom we're still in touch with now um, and are tracking us. And I think like, you know, had we not gone through that experience, we wouldn't have had an opportunity to frankly build relationships, right. which is the most, I, I do think is the most important. So you went over in the demo day. What's that? So you went over. Oh, all of them went over, everybody. Yeah. And this is in the middle of May, like three weeks before, and I didn't feel comfortable going into it or even raising any money at all, because at the time, the news cycle was inflation is coming, there was rumblings of you know economic turmoil uh, just on the horizon. I'm like, this is just gonna be a disaster. Everybody didn't really, nobody around me really felt similarly and lo and behold it was a, a, an absolute you know pumping of the brakes i think all of the vcs that we spoke to regardless of stage were like we're just kind of waiting and seeing we'll talk to you in a couple months we'll see what happens after the economy stabilizes and so yeah we totally went over and after that like i had a really strong point of view that investors aside for the second let's go get contracts let's go get revenue this has to be an operation that's like worth funding and that's really what we doubled down on after that. And so how long after that point did you go back into the fundraising process? Was, did you set a target of like, if we can get three customers, then I'll go back, or was it time? It was actually a little bit more organic. Uh, we didn't have like a, a structure around time. Investors that we had met the first time around, um, really over the five months after that into like October, following that May, Investors that we had met, um, you know, tr tracked us and they, you know, we had been communicating that we were closing first contract, second contract, we had real customers, actual real things to talk about, not just conjecture. And that was when we progressively were in a position to accept checks. And so we did not have a structured, properly structured round. It was, you know, there were certain investor, investors that um, we felt were aligned with us as as people, as a business, and you know, they liked what we were proving out. And you know, one check begot the next check. You know, a month after that, and so it was little by little that we proved ourselves out, which ultimately kind of snowballed at the beginning of, of this year. But it was a step by step process for us. And um, one of the things I was going to follow up and ask about. Um, just drop stuff down now. Um, oh. Uh, the initial checks uh, that were coming in, were they individuals or small funds or? These were small, uh, I would call them pre-seed smaller funds. Gotcha. Yeah. And did they ask about a lead or total round size or who else is closing and why am I the only 100K check in this? And no, um, quite the opposite, which is kind of why I, I'm forever indebted to them and love them, you know, truly because 
uh, different from other all of the other conversations that are looking for a signal that somebody else with potentially more brain power than them is you know saying yes. These people took a flyer on us and they said we don't care if there's a structure around this round. I'm going to give you this check at this time. You don't need to have any other investor. Um, and for us, that frankly just let us keep building. Like we wouldn't have we wouldn't have survived without that. And so. It was that level of conviction, that ability to just say yes, agnostic of what everybody else is saying that you know brought us together. Did you talk to anybody else during that period of time who did sort of want a bigger round? Everybody. Oh, everybody, right? Yeah, so, everybody, yeah. And, and, it, and it, so there were two investors, uh, Hustle Fund and uh, now Everywhere uh, Ventures. Um, they formerly the fund. Formerly the fund. Uh, Hustle Fund wrote a small check. Um, followed by Everywhere Ventures probably six weeks later. And actually, they came together later, months later, and they said, actually, Ned is proving ground. Uh, let's come together and, and co-lead. And so it was actually after working with them a little bit that they felt that they could really support us with that lead indicator, um, which was very helpful for us. Gotcha. And so what was the nature of your initial first few checks in? Did you have a specific lead or is it just you set the terms? And yeah, good good question. So um, to yeah, uh, give a slightly verbose answer to, to that. So the, the way our, our fundraising process did not go quite the way that we expected it to. Um, I don't know <laughs> if it ever does. Um, but we had you know a bunch of conversations with folks who were potential angels, a bunch of kind of just warm kind of get to know you conversations with investors before we were raising where we were just meeting folks learning about how they invested what their processes look like and whatnot um and at the same time we applied for an accelerator that we weren't expecting to get um we uh got the good news that we got it um and so we had a term sheet in front of us um, but with one term sheet, we weren't really sure. Like in this market, everybody is talking, you know, especially this is, you know, I think late Q1 of this year, um, you know, are, are these good terms? Are these bad terms? You know, what, what does it look like? What could we get? And so we were very uncomfortable with the idea of passing on it without other terms out there, but also uncomfortable with the idea of signing it without knowing what we could, you know, what, what we could get on the market. Um, so basically we used that to catalyze the round. So we went out to everybody that we've talked to and said, you know, hey, we have this term sheet it explodes, you know, end days. An accelerator um, term Yeah, an accelerator term sheet. Um, it explodes in, you know, in, in, a, in a week or so. Um, we're thinking about whether to take it, but we're not sure kind of, you know, uh, what folks think or what we could get. Um, you know, can you, you know, can you consider us? And if, if so, you know, what's your process? We had some folks say like, no, we can't move that fast. You know, um, we'd love to stay in touch. Um, and we had some folks say like, yeah, we can. Let's let you know. Let, let's have you all in for a more formal meeting. And some of those, well, some of some of those didn't. But basically, we used that to catalyze, and that got us to our first um, institutional term sheet, um, which was was led by uh, Box Group. Um, and once Box Group uh, gave us a yes, I think it made it a lot easier for other folks to get to a decision. Um, easier for other folks to, to get to a, a yes. Also, um, so we also um, uh, got a yes from uh, twelve. Um, which we uh, which which we uh, went with, and then we um, we rounded out the round with angels. So we kind of did the opposite of what I think might be typical, where we focus on locking in institutionals and then move to angels. That was not our plan at all. You know, before we got this accelerator term sheet, we thought we would you know close some angels, use that to to generate momentum, close, you know, use that to spin up a larger round. But because of this accelerator term sheet, we used that as kind of the catalyst instead. What uh... What was the connection to? Did you know the folks at Fox beforehand? Like, how did you actually connect to the person who actually gave you the term sheet? We were actually introduced to them by another VC who ultimately passed, which was <laughs> was interesting. But which um, people always say is the worst kind of introduction. Well, they hadn't passed at the time of okay. the introduction. <laughs> but yeah, when they we got the the no from the person who made the introduction before we got the yes from Box Group, and we weren't sure, you know, what does this mean? You know, yeah, you, this really you, you assume that that was going to tank the intro. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the person who made the introduction was from a multi-stage fund. Box Group is, is very focused on early stage, so I, I think it was it was the right fit for them, and and you know we're we're incredibly thankful for for them you know being willing to kind of be the first folks to take the lead. Um, and I think for the multi-stage folks, it was just a little bit a little bit early. Gotcha. Yeah. 
how did you fill the funnel? Like, where where did the intros come from, and was there any consistency to like where you got the best or most meaningful intros to? Uh, I mean, it, it when you look at the R funnel, I think the the, the early kind of you know uh, starting gunshot was the forum demo days. So that put us in front of probably thirty different investors, and I think to what you described, we actually experienced kind of a a handoff certain investors would intro us around and then separately i think like there's nothing frankly regimented about this which is we just beg borrowed and steal like every favor anybody that i knew who knew somebody else like we really just kind of went after it with a crowbar and started just bashing in taillights to get in front of certain folks and it wasn't clean right there's nothing clean about it um but i think you know in the end it created um it created some motion and friction where the name of the business started, you know, getting passed around. Our deck started getting passed around. Um, again, all to make sure to say, like, we were being rejected left and right. Like, there were not any yeses for six or seven months. Um, and in point of fact, the first two investors, like, other than Forum Everywhere and Hustle, actually kind of turned us down the first time, six months before, five months before they came back around. And so, you know, it really just was a progressive step by step. Um, you know, approach where people were uh, really stepping up for us, some of whom really knew us very well, frankly, others who didn't know us at all, but thought what we were doing was sound and, uh, you know, a, a strong business, uh, you know, a, a approach. And so, you know, for us, we just found ourselves with like a dearth of introductions. And then it really became, a, 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 you know, a, a an exercise in developing actual relationships. Like very few times are we, am I gonna get off on the first call and say, well, actually that's not true. But, <laughs> uh, but there, it happened once. And so, but otherwise, you know, talk to me in six weeks, send me your distribution email on, you know, when good things happen and good things, good relationships in business, I think in any business, it's all relationship based, but I needed to build trust with these people, not just for them to trust me, but frankly, I would like to trust the investors that are that are going to be investing in us as well. They're going to be around that table for quite some time. So, you know, good things take time. Ultimately, it turned out well at the end of the day. Uh, that's one of the, the most noticeable differences I, I see uh, among uh, different types of founders is that the willingness to make an ask of your network. I, I'm often really blown away with the dichotomy of um, how mostly guys in my network who I may not have spoken to for 12 years, met once at a conference, but I happen to be the only LinkedIn connection they have to somebody else will have no problem dropping me a line and say, hey, been a long time, you know, and, and, I, and I, it sort of empathized a little bit because I'm like, you gotta be pretty desperate if I'm the connection you have to this person. I, I gotta imagine that if you would have had a better one, you would have used it, but, you know, you show me your deck, your blurb, this seems legit, it happens to be what I know this person is looking for, so sure, I'll make that forward. And then other times where, um, you know, women in my network or, you know, who who I would have thought knew me pretty well, was say, oh, I wasn't sure if I could make that, that ask. And it, and it really, it like, very few of us have a ton of VC connections in a Rolodex. And so like, I don't know how you would do this process unless you were willing to, to stretch a little bit and to say, you know what, ah, actually I, I kind of know that person, but what the hell? I mean, you, you guys probably had to make a lot of those types of asks. I tried my, I mean, it's so uncomfortable. It's unbelievably uncomfortable. I did it rarely. I think we were lucky where Actually, for us, the real momentum came from other investors that passed us off. That was our story. Um, and ultimately, the other investors that invested came together and really supported us in the very, very end. But along the way, you know, you're know, you re-sparking conversations with folks that you, have, you might not have spoken to in a, a little while. And it is uncomfortable. But nonetheless, you know, what are you willing to do for the survival of your business if you think that there's a there there? And so you know, it's... It, you know, Nobody comes yeah, back and like yeah. yells at you for how, no. how dare you and think I, that I would, one conference I, I would, was and, enough to make this. And ask. I would never ask anybody that I really just didn't feel comfortable with. That's mm -hmm. just I, that wasn't our story. I think we were 
we were, I'm, I think we've talked about this. I am particularly unnetworked in the VC space, given like a professional background. And so like I was really just starting from scratch and developing relationships for the first time, you know, all together. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, okay, so as you're starting to get uh, some traction and some, <clears throat> some meetings, um, let's talk about actually getting people over the line and, and the process of, you know, you, you take an initial meeting, you talk to people. Um, how did the processes with the folks that closed different from the ones that, that ultimately didn't get there? And, and was there anything that you did to sort of, you know, uh, bring those folks over the line or just make that process more efficient? Or was it inefficient and you want to talk about how maybe you wasted time with people that didn't get there? That's a good question. Um, I'm thinking about it off the I mean, I, I think that actually our process was fairly similar for the folks who closed and didn't close. Um, you know, of course, there were more steps for the folks who closed because we kept moving forward and in their funnel. But I think they were pretty similar. I mean, and the typical steps were, you know, an intro coffee or Zoom, depending on whether folks were, were you know, based in New York or not, um, maybe a second one. Um, then you know an individual meeting with um, you, you know with, with with a with a partner um, and then you know a larger group of you know okay this is this is going to be the real presentation then maybe another follow up or two from there that were shorter and they wanted to ask deeper questions and then a yes or a no so I would say that yeah I think the processes were similar I think we got better at running those meetings um, but I don't think they looked that way. different. Um, we, I think being able to anticipate questions that folks were going to ask and speak to, so to, to give you a, a practical example, so both my co-founder and I are fairly technical. I, um, you know, come from a, a computer science background and my co-founder comes from a product background. Um, we both think of ourselves as very um, business astute, but um, it didn't really occur to us that if you looked at our resumes or, or you looked at our deck, you would come away with this question of like, who's actually going to try to do sales? Who's going to try to, you know, make sure that the business is, is you know, being financially, you know, responsible and whatnot. Um, and then that would be an open question and people might leave the room having never um, even asked us that, but that, that might be, you know, uh, a, a question they come away with. And so as we started to realize that that was a question folks had, we made a point of early in our pitch kind of trying to speak to that. Um, so I think that's probably the most concrete example I can think of, but just learning like what are the questions people are going to be asking, how can we demonstrate expertise of that before it even becomes an open question in the, in the room. Gotcha. I think for us it was mostly timing. Timing I've learned is pretty much everything and totally out of my control. And so um, when Hustle Fund invested, it was really, you know, them showing a, a level of hustle not to uh, but they, they moved very quickly I had two conversations with you know one of um, one of the investors there who frankly has become our chief evangelist has made everything happen for us you know since that time but she came back with an answer within uh, 36 hours and and I did not necessarily have to have a, a particular lean in posture there um, and then with everywhere ventures it was the very end of last year and so the end of December I think there was a level of kind of the years closing out, we have one investment left, we had met the right person at the right time. And again, it was a fairly quick, quick process. And so that for, for us, it, we found ourselves like with all other things in our experience, it was just a matter of, frankly, timing and having <laughs> having the world happen at us rather than, um, you know, kind of leaning in, making us getting it over the line. I think the getting it over the line experience happened really in February and March when we went out. Well, and I think it's interesting because every story that you could tell yourself or that you hear about like, oh, you can't raise after Thanksgiving or don't start those meetings or whatever, you're in a situation where somebody's like, well, yeah, we were intending on doing 10 deals this year and we've got nine and a guy we like and let's get this off our plate before that the was a, That was really, I think, a large part of what had happened for us at the end of the day. And also being as a founder, frankly, being open to conversation, right? I think that there are sometimes like rules of what you just described. You know, you don't go out after, you know, month X or before month Y, or you don't talk to these people at certain firms. I honestly, 
first, didn't really know any of that. And second, didn't really care for any of that. And so I would talk to everybody at any given time if I could get a conversation. And it yielded for us something that worked uh, in, our, in, in our favor in the end. And, well, and, and sometimes getting on people's calendars is a function of, of being a little contrarian, too. I remember I used to make regular quarterly trips to the West Coast before all the West Coast folks started getting apartments here and, and opening up offices here. And, and uh, I remember uh, having to reschedule and kind of putting it off and realizing my only opportunity to do it for the remainder of that quarter was the week directly before Christmas. And at first I was like, oh, well, you know, that's, I'm not going to do that, right? But then I realized, like, no one takes off the week before Christmas. They take off between Christmas and New Year's. So I was like, well, let's just see if I can get some meetings, right? And I emailed 12 VCs. And within 48 hours, I went 12 for 12 on getting meetings because there was nothing on their calendar that week. Because all the founders thought the same way. You know, what am I going to get on somebody's calendar right before the holidays? Well, well, yeah, they were sitting in their offices literally with nothing to do uh, because they closed out the rest of their deal flow. They, they had wide open opportunity. And you know, like if I was a founder pitching, OK, I might not get momentum during the holiday, but I don't want to be pitching on the Tuesday that everyone comes back because their inboxes are going to be completely full when everybody else is doing the same thing. So if I could you know, take that meeting right before Christmas and follow it up with like, hey, I'd love to talk again after the holidays. Why don't we put something on the calendar? You might be able to get a meeting that, that morning on Tuesday. It might be the first meeting of the next year. So there's always a way to sort of play it opposite to the way that everybody else is, is going about it. Um, cool. So uh, before we go to any uh, audience questions, um, let's talk about price. So the thing I always tell founders is um, I'm incentivized to buy as much of the company as possible. You are incentivized to sell as little of the company as possible. How did you guys get over that? Um, did you, um, you know, uh, was there a, a bidding process, a negotiation? Did you have kind of a bogey in mind, a, a certain you know, dilution, like how did you approach thinking about price and what would you tell other founders who are worried about it, especially in this environment? Uh, I think, you know, if you're looking at it through the lens of economic history, my belief is that we are in a take what you can get economy. And so for me, my 100% mandate for first my angel investors that were you know, from day one with us, my first mandate was to survive, not go out of business. And so I think for us, when you look and look through you know, a long game through that lens, not just what's my price going to be today. It actually you know, takes the edge off when you're probably going to price it a little lower than you would have hoped. You know, I think for FinTech, before May of last year, wild pre-seed or seed valuation, wild you know, like back of the envelope, kind of 10, 15 million, 20 million valuations for pre-product businesses. And I think for us, we frankly just kept our price from the angel round flat because the market corrected down since we said it. And, you know, I I saw that as that's what the market bears. That's, you know, the market will always win. Um, and so, you know, for me, I think just the fact that we're in, we're in the game still and able to grow and hire people as we did last week for the first time and just even have a level of dynamism. It's just far outweighs whatever, you know, uh, valuation we had because that's going to change in time. And so, yes, I had to take a haircut um, versus somebody that might have raised a year before me, but I'm still here. And, and that person's that. not in good shape and right that, now. Yeah, either, and, so. and, and, and that actually is the, which is actually the biggest surprise. And so I find myself talking to other founders who raised a year before me, $3 million, $4 million. We did not raise that much uh, during our pre-seed. So, and they actually have shared with me, like, wow, I wish I could have built our business the way you're building it, which is, a little bit at a time and you're getting customers and you're failing in public but it's going to be a, and i said why would you ever say this because we don't even have a product we have four million dollars sitting in the bank i'm like all right i guess that is a different you know place to be in right now and a post money valuation it's going to make uh, yes, the next round yeah, really difficult yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, so from our perspective, we were conscious of dilution 
more than we were, you know, we, we came in with a, you know, we don't want to go above 20% dilution rather than we don't, you know, we need X dollars and we'll take whatever we can do to, to get there. Um, and so, you know, I think, yeah, if we were raising two years ago, we might have gotten a lot more money for that 20%. Um, uh, sitting here, I think I'm, I'm happy about that. I would rather have a valuation that we can beat in the future than something that's hanging over our heads of, you know, wow, if somebody's thinking about this from a revenue multiple perspective, we have to do a lot with not that much money in the end. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so our approach was to set a dilution cap. We held firm to that dilution cap. Um, and then, you know, raised on the, um, you know, on the, on the terms that we were offered. And we did not, we were much more focused on finding the right folks than on really hammering over, over dilution. And I think we, we got, um, or over valuation rather, um, and, and we got what felt like a fair valuation for where we were at. Um, you know, being a pre-product company, if somebody had offered us a, you know, $15 million valuation, I think that would have been a terrible idea for us. Um, so <laughs> nobody did. Um, uh, but I think, yeah, I think the, the, the terms were, were fair and not so beneficial. Did the fact that you guys were hiring a team to build the product and that you were technical yourself factor into that whether we should um, take a little more dilution? Because ultimately, if you said, hey, I'm going out for 20%, let's see what we can get. Yeah. Somebody could have come up and say, at the end of the process, and say, well, why don't you take an extra 250 for me or an extra 500 for mm -hmm. me? Um, but you guys have some capability to sort of roll up your sleeves yourself and without necessarily adding a whole bunch of, you know, costs, contribute to building up the product. If you had to hire your whole team, yeah. would you have maybe felt a little bit differently about having a little extra money? Uh, I, yeah, I think definitely. And, and that was actually a comment that we got from one of our, our VCs who, who came on board, said one of the things that, they, that made them more comfortable about us as a team is, it's a lot easier to you know get through those early stages if you can build the product yourself, right? We can validate ourselves, um, and we're just starting to hire now. But we've been you know building software for you know for a, a few months at this point, and we've been able to do that our, on our own. So doing that with um, yeah, I think we would have wanted more money and probably um, gotten a little bit more skepticism if we were if both of us were non technical and we you know we couldn't build the product without bringing on. And I think that probably works in this environment. Being able to build a product yourself and sort of extend that runway a little bit to do more stuff because you can contribute as founders, uh, I think that is playing. But I also think that things that are currently selling too. I know like the last deal I did out of my portfolio, I was very conscious of um, the, the runway question and the next round funding question. And, and I was sort of choosing between two companies, one of whom I really liked the product idea, but um, wasn't going to be that close to revenue anytime soon, and another that was already selling in the market. And while historically about 50% of the companies that I've backed are pre-product, for this deal now at this time frame, I was like, you know what, I, I just feel more comfortable doing something where it's a lightweight team. If we had a cut to, you know, and, and, and use founder-led sales to kind of get to break even and extend the runway a little bit, we, we could because it was more, uh, I guess, flexibility would be the key in both of those situations, right? If you could conceivably at some point, if you had to, cut everybody but you and your co-founder, go nights and weekends and write code then and, and yeah. sell it on your own. If that was like, that's the minimum viable product. You yeah, know, somebody coming in now, like you have a customer, right? You could sell in nights and weekends and do, yeah. you know. We sold, I mean, we built and, you know, won our first seven lender customers before we hired our first, um, our, you know, our first engineer. So, and it, uh, but that was only because we had to, like, right. you know, and that was like, a, it was force function on us to do it that way. Gotcha. Cool. Is, are there any questions from the audience that uh, folks want to jump in on? Yeah, so we'll go one, two, three. Okay. During the entire process, um, at what point, or several points, with respect to once you came to, let's say, a crossroads in terms of important decisions, and you had the factual information in front of you, to what extent you really basically went with your gut, your intuition, and had the facts pretty much as... In other words, you kind of backed into the facts and basically you used your intuition as far as 
the decision for that particular situation going forward versus looking for just going by the facts if, okay. if you had a particular scenario statistically factually yeah you would go with option a that's almost a no-brainer but instead you took a look below the surface the dynamics etc and instead went with option b and it was driven more by your intuition as to how you were going to move forward okay so factually most startups fail but you guys have the intuition that maybe your startup would not are there any other things that yeah i think it, you know uh, there was a point last august where it was basically give or take might not you know uh, be around the next week just given the level of funding, given the level of just feeling demoralized from you know a, a failed uh, funding experience, uh, fundraising experience the first time, where it was really uh, uh, driven by intuition, a gut instinct. Like there were really fairly few facts in our favor, other than what I believe, which was just the economic thesis where the economy was heading, where we fit into the economy, and the fact that we had a customer, a singular customer at that time. And that's all I felt was needed. And I kind of was just like, tune, let's tune out everybody else for the time being and let's give it another two months, right? And that allowed for another customer to sign and the first check to come in after two, and so I think like it was just a matter of, that was an intuitive moment versus really looking at the numbers and saying, you know what, like we had wind at our backs, if anything, the wind was coming right at our faces. I think that's a really interesting way of putting it because I, I think like, if you can uh, constrain the risk, right? You say, hey, factually, this set of data says that maybe I shouldn't do this, but I'm going the other way. But I'm gonna, not gonna bet my whole career on this or bet my, like, I'm gonna limit it and say, I think it's this, but I'm gonna control for how much I'm willing to make that bet. I'll let this play out over a limited period of time and, well, the limited period of time was just how much money we had. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> and so, like, our my my decision was, you know, given a parameter, um, but it did also, you know, one of the variables in that function was, you know, seventy investors told me one thing, my customer is telling me another. That's basically like the the weight that I went with. Your paying customer. My paying customer. Yeah, that's important. <laughs> Any, anything to add in a similar I, I mean, I, I think, you know, for us, like the biggest place where we, you know, use user intuition was deciding to take the leap and, you know, to begin with, especially as we were sort of reaching this point of commitment. It's, this is, this is like the worst time ever to leave your job, right? Like, you know, um, whereas a couple of years ago, I think a person might have had the sense, well, if I quit my job, um, you know, I might be able to go out and find another thing a few months later. Um, you know, as the waves of tech lay layoffs came in, you know, that became less and less certain. And we definitely, um, my co-founder has a young young child, and and so I think especially for him, you know, it's a serious commitment to 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 jump into something with you know with only our our own you know big accounts to fund it to to start. Um, and so we had this moment, you know, late last year where we said, you know, if we're going to jump in, you know, is this really the right time? Like, you know, and we decided to do it, but I think that was a moment where I think, you know, the peers for the like, daughters and sons of it would say, like, you know, that now is not the time, you know, wait, wait a year. I'm, I'm very happy that we did, but I, I think that was the, the probably the, the biggest in, intuitive moment. Cool. I thought it was a hand. Good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I have a question for Mr. Um are you familiar with the joke for Bill Gates' daughter? Okay, so um, I told my son, you will marry the girl I choose. He said, no. I told him she's Bill Gates' daughter. He said, okay. I called Bill Gates and I said, I want your daughter to marry my son. Bill Gates said, no. I told Bill Gates, my son is CEO of World Bank. Bill Gates said, okay. I called the president of World Bank and asked him to make my son the CEO. He said, no. I told him my son is Bill Gates' son-in-law. He said, okay. So you get the idea. I was just wondering, uh, did you guys have any kind of uh, this implemented in your fundraising strategy? The, the <laughs> fake, like a roundabout way of getting to the fake it till you make it uh, question. Uh, yeah, were there any points at which you, you know, could get there, but maybe you weren't and or already, you know, ethical questions along those lines. Good, good question. And I, I, I like the, I like the, the, the joke. Um, 
We didn't. I mean, we tried to be super transparent in our in our process. Um, so I, I think for us, like that's kind of the company that we want to run. We want to work with investors who prize that, and you know, and I think there is like a sort of startup hustle, hustle culture, which we like intentionally d do not want of kind of like this fake it till you make it thing. So I think that was a values judgment for us. There's nothing I, I think you know wrong uh, off the cuff about doing it, but I think for, for us, like yeah, it was it was an important value call to to, to be be transparent. Yeah, I would agree. I think if anything. <laughs> We were overly truthful in what we had or did not have. Um, and for those that were okay investing in two contracts or three contracts, you know, that is what we showed them. And, you know, we presented our customers and we presented our product as it was at that time. And that was that, right? Like that was real. I think when we went out originally in May, we told a story, right? But we didn't we consciously knowing that there was no working product yet. And that was the story we were telling. But I think for us, um, the experience was basically to be completely tra transparent. Uh, and you know, the folks that ultimately you know came and worked with us saw very clearly the material, like the, the material value in what we had created and what we have not created yet, and they made a decision based off of based off of that. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think like to me, like it's like you know, you, when you're this early stage and you're raising, it's like people are. Are, are gonna be here for the journey. Like surely the product and company six months from now will look radically different than it does today. So if we can't be like honest with you now, are we, you know, how, how will that work in the future? So I'd be curious to hear like from a VC perspective, like, you know, I imagine that you all see a lot of people thinking until you make it and it has to be trans, you have to know what you're looking at. And yeah, I don't know. It seems like it would, would be hard to, to stomach that. Yeah. So. I've been on both sides of this, and I'll sort of try and weave what I think is maybe a guideline that could be helpful. Um, one of the most important sort of fake it till you make it questions I've ever answered was literally the very, very beginning of my career, which is like I was a high school intern, and somebody asked me whether or not I knew how to use Excel. And this was in 1990, graduated in the 90s. Seven. Uh, my dad had brought a computer into the house like 10 years before that when I was in the third grade in 87. But we used like Microsoft Works or whatever spreadsheet came with that. So it wasn't quite Excel, but I had seen a spreadsheet, you know. And I answered very confidently, yes, of course I knew how to use Microsoft Excel. But what I was really answering and what I, what I literally thought very consciously up about the time is, this person is asking me if they give me a project that has to be done in Excel, will I be able to complete it? And because I knew there was some time in between both when like that day and the day I would start and the day that the project was given to me and when it would be due, that I was 100% confident in my ability to figure it out between now and then. And, uh, you know, that, that I knew I could come through on that promise and that so I wouldn't let this person down in terms of what was being delivered to me. Um, that is different than like, I have heard founders tell me that there's a certain level of interest or that certain people had not made their decision yet, right? So whereas like you previously started a company and got funded by some other fund and now you're coming to me, not them first. And so an obvious question is like, why aren't they funding you? And not that I care that much about like who else is funding you, but like fairly certain that if they backed you before, you, you would have had to have had a question, right? And they're like, well, you know, they're thinking about whether this is a fit, blah, 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 whatever. And then I go back to them and be like, yeah, we don't like the idea. We told them no. And like, that's dishonest because you know that the answer is no. It's also kind of dumb because you, I'm going to go back to them. Right? It was so easy for me to do diligence and catch you in that lie that it's just really short-sighted of you to say something like that. Um, I've been on the other side of founders telling me that some people were in and fully committed when they really weren't and still were very clearly in the middle of their process. And I, and I would say to the other funder, like, is there any conceivable way that they have misunderstood? And they're like, 
Yeah, I, I don't see how. Like, we are definitely not at the end of that process. And I failed from, from that. So, you know, you, you, you want to be careful. I understand the wanting to show traction, but I, I really do believe that, like, if somebody's going to get there, um, they're going to get there based on exactly where you are now. And, you know, if you are pre-product, you're pre-product. If you're pre-customer, you're pre-customer. Um, and, and if they're not, they'll just probably be able to, you know, kind of figure out the, the, the truth of it. Um, you know, versus like, it's a little different when, um, you know, uh, a customer asks for a feature and you're, you're quite sure that your development team would be, you know, fully on board with being able to deliver that. And you say like, funny you should ask because that feature is already in a work in the works and it's going to be done by next week and it's definitely not in the works now so, you know and then you go back to your dev team and like okay here's what we have to build like i think that's fine if you have the confidence in your team to be able to deliver you you have not taken money from that person yet to deliver it so you're not going to leave them hanging like you know so there's a there's a good and a bad version of that that i think is a, is a right way to play cool and i Follow-up yeah, question sure. would be would, uh, for you, Charlie. Would you rather have um, pre-product like in a beta stage that you would value more than some smaller version of the product, let's say the MVP, mm -hmm. which is not really good but has some traction and it is maybe failing at some yeah. point, but you have feedback and you learn and you know how to iterate from that? This, 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 this is a good question about sort of getting some traction versus none at all, sort of the, you know, nothing like numbers to ruin a good story kind of uh, thing. Um, I think one of the most difficult things for founders is to figure out what to do first with their initial little slug of money if it's not a full round, right? If you are sitting there going, I have 50 grand of savings, I have 25 grand of savings, how do I spend this to show the most, and I, and I always think back to, it was a, a startup that pitched me, and it was in the, um, the, the engagement ring business, which is a, a very big industry, lots of money spent. And, and they had a particularly unique product take on the way that you would sort of select and develop the ring. Um, one that would require a lot of front end development, design, you know, and if it was going to be good, like some really top tier designers and thoughtful user research and all that sort of stuff. What they wound up doing with their like tiny little founder slug of money is just getting kind of any old Shopify site up and running just to show that they could sell some rings. And while it was traction, technically, it just didn't show the promise of the product. You know, you would have been better off spending the money that you spent on getting the Shopify set up and running, just getting a really good designer to do clickable wireframes and having nothing useful. Because for your particular startup, the design and the customer interaction and the thoughtfulness around the brand is the hard part. And you should have shown me, you, you would have been better off showing traction on the hard part even though that wouldn't mean an actual customer, an actual user, or all of that sort of stuff. But figuring out like where the hard part is or what I think is going to be the hardest part is sometimes not obvious. And I understand why people sort of, you know, try and get some lightweight traction with something. And, and that's happened all the time with like things that ultimately you want to be enterprise customers, but like all you've been able to do is get a handful of SMBs or individuals paying $9.95 a month or something because it's a very simple product. And it's hard because I'm like, yeah, I don't doubt that you can get a couple people paying 10 bucks for this, but ultimately is Bank of America going to use this for their X, Y, or Z and pay you 200 grand a year? I, like you don't have any traction to that extent and, and where that tends to come up a lot is actually when I pass and then three months later, six months later, I get the updates and they're like, well, we got 50 more customers. I'm like, yeah, 10 bucks a month. And I, my, my pass was because I didn't think that somebody bigger would sign up. 
and you still don't have, like, so yes, you technically have traction, but you don't have any traction against what I perceive as the hard part of this thing. I, the thing I said you couldn't do, and you told me all the things you did in the meantime, except any movement on the one thing I said you couldn't do. And so picking where to get traction and where to use that initial sum of money, I think, is very hard to figure out. Cool. Um, any other before we let you guys go? Uh, yeah, I have a question on, uh, also on traction. Uh, in your examples, it's, a, it's more of a product, mm -hmm. a physical product, and how you're designing it. It's harder to get traction mm -hmm. in that sort of environment. Um, in for software companies, would you recommend, I see a lot of stuff where people are recommending no code solutions mm -hmm. and whatnot. Do you recommend to just, if you do have a, if you have found a sort of small slug of cash, right. that they go off and just do like a no code yeah. thing? Yeah, I, I think if, look, if, if the, for example, if the hard thing is sales, right, and, and, you know, for example, like, um, I backed a company called Nokin, which is my most, you know, the, my saddest sort of COVID casualty because it was in the, the travel space. Uh, I d took two trips on Nokin. They were amazing, amazing experiences. It, it was literally, you, you, you showed up, you answered like three questions about what your travel, what kind of a travel you were, and they'd be like, great, here's your whole itinerary and your trip to Iceland. And they'd also set you up with a concierge. It was, it was awesome. I, I really wish they would like, go back and do it again. It was, it was so great. But like, the tough thing in the travel space is customer acquisition and sales, right? Because it's a fairly big buy, you know, travel is expensive, and, and it is um, uh, highly sought after keywords and, and all of this sort of stuff. Um, they got $100,000 or so of customer traction with um, a, it's not Figma, it's the thing that was a thing before Figma. Envision. Uh, what was it? Envision. Envision. They used an Envision clickable demo app as their product. They basically, like, you bought on a, a, a site and you know they sent you a pay request or whatever and when you paid them they sent you the link to an envision demo app that there's essentially a clickable wireframe that they literally hand built with your trip and the map itinerary and all that sort of stuff and that's what you buy and they sold a hundred thousand dollars of that and they did all of the other booking sort of you know man behind the curtain kind of stuff so they literally did a hundred grand in revenue with no code and not not even bubble like they did like less than bubble it was the, you know the little click, clickable wireframe and like that to me was a signal of two things and first of all like clearly you proved that the customer wanted this thing right and and you can acquire and sell customers so that was great um all of the the actual app stuff while it certainly would have been better if it was actually built None of it was so technically difficult that I didn't think they would be able to build it if they actually got a developer on, you know, versus like a security and privacy related thing, like you, you kind of need to show that you can you sort of build that. But also like it was a great signal for the team. Just like, oh, that's pretty gritty. Like, and I, that's pretty, you know, scrappy to go out and, and, you know, have the confidence and courage to go out and do that and put something out there that wasn't sort of perfect. And, and, uh, and I've never seen anybody you know, use that as the way that they were doing sort of their app. So it it it, uh, it checked a lot of boxes for me, and I think it was a good way to sort of go about it. But you know, if you're on a fintech or security platform and you're promising some level of stuff, and you're on Bubble or whatever, like no, maybe that's not the right thing to show for your particular product. But if it is a something that's relatively commoditized on the on the the tech side and it really is about showing a willingness to pay or ability for you to get sales as a team or to, to prove that you as a technical founder could actually start selling or somebody who didn't have sales experience could start selling like yeah I, I, I think that's useful but it's also by the way I think it's worth having investor conversations super early to find out right because you could go and do that and uh, look, some of these no-code platforms are not exactly the easiest to figure out either. So it is work, 
right? Maybe it's your work versus the developer. But maybe the investors don't even care, right? So there's no harm to sort of saying, like, this is what I'm thinking of doing. Um, you know, my first instinct is to just build this on a no code and sort of prove that. You may find an investor who is used to investing pre product to be like, you know, but it's not going to be a great experience. And really, the best part of the experience would be if this automatically integrated with customers' accounts, which you're not going to be able to do, and it's going to be kind of kludgy. And like, you you should you should raise a little something to make sure you're putting the best thing out in front of you. You know, so you could save yourself that time of of doing that. Um, worst comes to worst, they say. That sounds awesome. I'd love to see what you get up and running, even on a no-code platform. Let's continue the conversation. And, and uh, so this way you get some directional feedback. Because the flip side of that is like, what if you don't talk to an investor? You go out and spend 100 grand of your own money in development costs or, or, or friends and family money. Yeah. And then it turns out very quickly you realize you built the wrong thing. Or and as an investor who's been you know, sees 2,000 things a year and has done over 100 investments, I come back and I'm like, listen, I can tell you three teams who tried to build that in the last year that you have not seen because they never saw the light of day because all three of them independently figured out that there's this stumbling block that you can't figure out until you have a product. Let me save you from that because I know it, but you can't, they're not on TechCrunch, they're not Googleable. they've made the same mistake. and you're about to do the same thing and ask somebody to build that same thing. So I think getting that early feedback, I think it's helpful. That's really good advice. Cool. Thank you. All right. Oh, good. One last question. You're the last one. Um, I'm wondering, when you guys are deciding to like iterate on products, how do you like rank future requests from customers? Is it like the big bank of America that Charles talked about, or like um, if you have like 50 small customers, or like is it your own vision, or which customer you talk to most? So if they all want you to do like a bunch of things, how would you rank uh, the iteration? I think for us, so we have two distinct types of customers. Some are smaller lenders, and then there's a big gap. There's larger lenders that we're working with. There's not a lot of in between. So for us, um, we look for just you know, homogenous asks to make sure that you know if it works for a small lender as well as a large lender, that's something that would go up in terms of our priority. That's like a high velocity need in the market, no matter how big the customer might be. And then everything, is, okay, how how much does this make sense given what we know about where the economy is heading, where the sector is heading. There's going to be one-off asks, like you just mentioned, where it's like, can you build me this thing by next week or two weeks from now? And that is more of a, that, that's a dance, right? Because in many cases, there are certain times we've been faced with that where we want to say yes, but ultimately we know that, that it will not be used by customers. And so I think it's a, it, it's a matter of not just value in terms of like the money you get from features, it's how long of a tail will that feature have in attracting new customers that are similar to the ones that you're currently you know working with right now cool um yeah and, and on our end i mean we're an enterprise sale so especially on our road to seed we expect you know a small number of customers but you know that will eventually convert at a pretty high dollar amount so we're we don't for the next couple of years we're not going to be in a position where we have you know 200 customers each of us giving us different demands so as we're out there doing research right now, um, you know, the folks who we're listening to the most are folks where there's sort of mission alignment where the things that they're talking about are the problems that we're trying to solve. Um, and then there's ideal customer profile alignment where they are the sort of people who we want to target for our, being one of our products. So those are the folks that we listen to. If somebody outside of our ICP or um, you know, asking us for things that are way outside of what we're trying to do, we jot those down but save them for later. Um, and then, in terms of who we're actually prioritizing building for, you know, our approach to the next phase of the business is getting a couple of design partners on, on board. So, folks who are enough mission aligned that they're willing to take the leap to sign up to a product that is just being built. Um, and the commitment from our end is like, if you're willing to take that leap with us, we will build something that works for you. For the, so for those folks, as long as their ask is mission aligned, we'll build it. But we need to keep that list of customers small enough that we can actually deliver on that with you know just a couple of folks coding. Thank you guys for taking the time thank out you. so much. Uh, so much, I really, really appreciate it. And uh, thank you guys all for coming. Uh, please do grab some food on the way out. Um, I don't want to see that go to waste. 
And uh, yeah, we will uh, be doing these things. I think our next one of these will be in September, uh, probably not so close to holiday weekend next time. But uh, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad they came through.